You are listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby of Torch in Houston, Texas. This is the Thinking Talmudist Podcast. All right, my dear friends, here we begin the Thinking Talmudist on the times of Messiah. Previously on the Thinking Talmudist, we discussed the different identifiers of the times of Messiah. Now, we need to be very careful about this because there have been many, many generations that have had all of the identifiers in place, and people were like, that's it, Mashiach is here. But And and let's just step back a second. What's the purpose of Mashiach coming? What is Mashiach coming? Now, everyone talks about Messiah. You even have Christians who uh, make believe they're Jews by saying they're Messianic Jews. They are Christians. They're not Jews. They're Christians. And that's part of the, the missionaries' uh, attempt to try to convert Jews to, to Christianity. So they're not Jews. You have, so what's this whole thing about Messiah? Messiah comes like this. And in fact, if we open up our Siddur, the end of our prayer ends with Aleinu Lishabach. And those of you who know the song, you're probably singing that tune right now in your mind uh, of Aleinu. But what do we say in Aleinu? We say that we need to, it is our duty to praise the master of all, to ascribe greatness to the molder of primeval creation, for he has not made us like the nations of the land, and he has not emplaced us like the families of the earth, for he has not assigned our portion like theirs, nor our lot like all their multitudes. And we talk about the distinction of the Jewish people being unique. And then the second part of it, we say, therefore, we put our hope in you, Hashem, our God, that we may soon see your splendorous might to remove detestable idolatry from the earth and false gods will be utterly cut off to perfect the universe through the almighty sovereignty. Anybody who's heard of the word tikkun olam, it comes from right here. It, this is where it, it's, it's a little bit of a mistake where people say that tikkun olam means just picking up plastic bags and soda cans from the street. That's very nice. It's a great act. It's a great deed. That's not what it's about. Tikkun olam means getting the world to a place where God will be known to all, where everyone will be able to say, ki hine elokeinu ze, ki vinu lo vyoshienu. The clarity that we're going to see that the Almighty is right here in front of us. You see, why do we have anti-Semitism in this world? Why do we all fear when we go on online and we look at the videos of what's going on in Gaza and we see the demonstrations happening in Antwerp, in England, in, uh, in Italy, in Dallas, Texas, in New York City, and we're like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. Maybe I should hide my flag. Maybe I should take off my amica. Maybe nobody should know that I'm Jewish because if someone does, who knows that that poor man who was murdered in Los Angeles at a rally by Palestinian activists. And by the way, no charges were pressed against the individual who killed him. And they have video of it. It's not like it's hidden. And we're wondering what in the world is going on here. Why is there no justice? Why is there no peace? Why is there no truth in the world anymore? That's because we are all in exile. As much as we don't feel it, we are. The only reason there's anti-Semitism in the world is because we're still in exile. We were in exile in Egypt. In Egypt, there was a different type of bondage. Now we have 2023 type bondage where we have the freedom on our phones, on our computers, in our jobs. We, can, we feel free. But then we have this burden of the hatred of the nations of the world. And this is going to be removed in the times of Messiah. In the times of Messiah, there's going to be absolute clarity. In the times of Messiah, there's going to be a revelation of the truth that no one can hide from. It will be so apparent, it will be so clear, crystal clear, that everyone will be able to say, ah, now we understand the truth. So, there are certain telling signs 
that the Talmud relates of what's going to be in the times of the Messiah. In our previous class, we talked about that the informers will become numerous, the students of Torah will will have become few, uh, the value of money will be completely gone. Money won't have any, you know total inflation like we're seeing today. Um, and also people will have despair in the redemption. They'll give up on it. And they'll say, perhaps we have no helper. We have no one who's coming to our assistance. People are going to give up on this concept of Messiah. And at that time, that's when Mashiach will come, when we're given up hope. All right, so now the Gemara discusses a related topic. Amar Rav Katina. Rav Katina says, Shis alfe shnei havo alma. For 6,000 years, the world will exist. This world that we're living in right now will only be around for 6,000 years. V'chad charuf. And for 1,000, it will be completely destroyed. Shinemar v'niska v'ashem levada bayomahu. As it is stated, Hashem alone will be exalted on that day. What is that day? So, first as we know, the Talmud elsewhere talks about these 6,000 years. We know in, in, in Jewish calculation of the age of the world, we count not from creation, we count from Adam and Eve. We count from Adam and Eve. Why not from creation? Because we didn't have, it. first is because the world was created for Adam and Eve, for mankind. Before that also, we didn't necessarily have a 24-hour cycle of the sun and the moon. We didn't have that cycle because there wasn't even a sun and a moon till the fourth day. So till the fourth day, there was no sun and the moon. So how long was each day? A day could be a million years. A day could be a billion years. The, the clock didn't get started yet. It's like, how old is a watch? How old is a watch? The watch's age begins when it starts ticking. Till then, it's not a watch yet. Right? It has the potential to be a watch, but till you don't put that battery inside and start the first tick, it's not a watch yet. It, yeah, I know. The, the electric watch, the, the, the ones with the uh, digital time is, uh, is a new invention. It didn't exist before, you know, 1970 something. That's true. It always it, it it was always there. We just didn't discover it. That's correct. So, in other places, what do we say? We talk about the first two thousand years is going to be the years of rebellion, and that's till Abraham, where there was total rebellion against God. Then there's going to be the two thousand years of discovery of God, and that's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and the tribes, and King David, and King Solomon, and and just discovery of Hashem. And now is the 2,000 years. The last 2,000 years that we're in is internalizing all of those things that we found, putting it into action in a real way. And at the end of it, we're right now at year 5,000. Anybody know? 5,784 from the creation of Adam and Eve. So there's only 216 years left to this world that we're living in in it as we know it 216 years according to the talmud the only 216 years left mean meaning between now and 216 years from now mashiach will be here amar abaya dissenting view abaya says tre charuf for 2000 years it will be destroyed shenemar yichayenu miyamin biyom shlishi yikaymenu v'nichilafanov as it states, after two days, each day is a thousand years, when it's right, each day is a thousand years, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up and he will live in his, we will live in his presence. No. You're thinking a nuclear bomb, like a good solid nuclear bomb, right? Just destroy all of humanity. What? Well, it can also be morals, that it will be destroyed of all morals and values and ethics, right? The Gemara cites support for Avkatina's view. It is taught in the Brisa in accordance with the opinion of Rav Katina. Kishem shebashvis mishametes shana achas l'sheva shanim 
just as the sabbatical year causes cessation one year out of seven years, kacha olam mishamet elef shanim leshivas alafim shana. So to the world seizes one millennium out of seven millennia. So just like we work six days and we rest on the seventh, just like we work six years and rest on the seventh, just like the world exists for six years, we rest, six thousand years, we, the world will rest for the seventh thousand year, for the seventh millennium. As it is stated, Hashem alone will be exalted on that day, which indicates that there will be a day when the world is desolate. The Omer, and further it says, Miz Moshir Liyoma Shabbos. We sing every Friday night, we sing this beautiful, beautiful psalm. A psalm, a song for the day of the Sabbath, which is interpreted as meaning a day, Yom Shekulo Shabbos, a day that is completely a Shabbos. The Omer Ki Elif Shonim Beinecha Ki Yom Esmol Ki Avor. And just like we say that a thousand years in your eyes are like a bygone yesterday, what does that mean? A thousand years is like a year in God's world, in God's existence, which indicates that the day referred to here is really the thousand years, that millennium that's going to be the world in emptiness. The following, Brysa gives the earliest possible date of the Messiah's arrival. So you want to know, okay, bottom line, when is he coming? When is this going to end? When are we going to, you know, it's a shocking thing. It really is a shocking thing. How many people can hate the Jews? I mean, come on. Most people don't even know a single Jew and they already hate us. They don't even know who we are, but they know they hate us. How's that possible? New York City. You see these students on college campuses around the world. They've probably never even met a Jew. But one thing they do know, they hate us. So when is this going to end? Tana de Belio, the Academy of Eliyahu taught the following b'risa. Sheishis Allah from Shana Hava Alma. The world is destined to exist for 6,000 years. Shnei Allah from Tohu. This is what we mentioned previously. The first 2,000 years were of nothingness. What does that mean, nothingness? Rebellion against God. Shnei alafim Torah. 2,000 years were of Torah, of the discovery of Torah, of the revelation of Torah. Shnei alafim Yemos HaMashiach. And the third 2,000 years should have been the days of the Messiah. Okay, so now we turn to 97b. And the Talmud here says, Because of our sins, which are numerous, the years that have gone from the Messianic era have gone and we missed it. We missed that opportunity, meaning till now. Now again, the Talmud was written almost 2,000 years ago. So in the times of the Talmud, they were waiting for the Messiah as well. Just like we say in our prayers every single day, that uh, sorry, not I I believe with a complete faith in the coming of Mashiach. Just like we say that, so too they said that that then they said that they believe in the coming of Messiah that he will be here today. Ah, oh, but he didn't come today, so he's going to come tomorrow. If he doesn't come tomorrow, he'll come the next day. But we believe every day that he's going to be there. The prophet Elijah reveals a date for the Messiah's arrival. Elijah said to Rabbi Yehuda, the brother of Rav Salah, the pious, The world is destined to exist for less than 85 jubilee cycles. All right? Less than 85 jubilee cycles. How many jubilees were there? Well, we have to calculate from its 50 years, correct. So not more than 85. Let's see that. 
85 times 50, so 4,250 years. But we have also, when was the Torah given? In year 2448. That would mean 6,698, which pushes us beyond the 6,000 year limit, unless I'm miscalculating this. So, and in the final Jubilee cycle, the son of David will come. Omar Lei Rabbi Huda asked Elijah, Bitrilaso or Besofo? Will he come at the beginning of the last Jubilee cycle or at the end because it's 50 years? Is he coming at the beginning of the 50 or at the end of the 50? Omar Lei Elijah said, Eni Yodea, I don't know. Kala or Eno Kala? Rabbi Huda asked, Will the final Jubilee cycle have ended by the time the Messiah comes or will or will it not have ended? Or Malay Elijah answered, Ain't you there? I don't know. The Gemara cites a different version of Elijah's last reply. Ravashi Omar Ravashi says, Hachi Amalei, this is what Elijah really said to Rav Yehuda. Ad hacha lo tistachi, tistachi lei, until now, do not expect the Messiah. Mekan ve'elach istachi lei, from then on, you can expect Messiah, meaning, Till that point, don't expect Messiah to be here. But after that point, we can. Now, it could also be that it's referring from the beginning of all time, meaning all time, meaning of Adam and Eve. And we start counting the 4,250 years from the beginning of when we count time, which would be now almost 1,500 years ago. The Gemara cites another prediction concerning the redemption. Shalach le Rav Hanan bar Tachlifa le Rav Yosi Rav Hanan bar Tachlifa sent the following message to Rav Yosef. Matzatzi Adam Echad. I met a man. Ubiyado migila achas ksuva ashuris v'loshen kodesh. In his hand, he had a scroll written in Ashuri script and in the holy tongue. What's Ashuri script? Ashuri script is the script that's written in the Torah. And Lashon HaKodesh is the holy language, the holy language that the Torah is written in. Omar Tiloi, I said to him, Zem from where do you get these scrolls? Omar Lee, he said to me, Lachayolos shel Romi Niskarti. I was hired as an aide to one of the soldiers of Rome, Ubein Gizne Romi Matsasiha, and I found it among the hidden treasures of Rome. The Kosovo, and what is written in it? Laachar Abbas Alofim Umasaim Vitishim Veechod Shana Libriya Saolam. That after four thousand two hundred and ninety one years from the world's creation, Haolam Yasom, the world will end. Mehan Melchamos Taninim. During some of them there will be wars of the great sea creatures. Mehen Melchemes Gogumagog. During some of them, there will be the wars of Gogumagog. And the world of Gogumagog is Gog, the king of Magog, will lead the nations in a cataclysmic war against the Jews in the land of Israel, as described in Ezekiel 38 and 39. This subject is dealt with above. We saw previously in Comment 94a note 12 says the following. Scripture indicates that the coming of Messiah will be connected with the invasion of the land of Israel by the armies of Magog, led by their king Gog. These invading armies represent the final effort of the nations to block the attainment of God's goal, the universal establishment of his kingship on earth. Scripture foretells that God will destroy the invading armies and the Messianic era shall then begin. The invasion of Judah by Sancherev and his army, the miraculous destruction of the invaders, and the presence of a righteous leader such as Chizkiah on the throne, all seem to fit description of Gogumog, of the Gogomogog episode. Thus, the Gemara states that Chizkiah's struggle with Sancherev could potentially have been the final war, the precursor of the Messianic era. Nevertheless, the Messianic potential inherent in these events were not, was not realized, as the Gemara goes on to explain. So we see that, as we mentioned in the beginning of class, there have been many, many indicators that 
the time of Mashiach was already here. But for whatever reason, the Almighty decided that Mashiach should not be revealed at those times. And we don't have the answer to it. We don't know what it is that is blocking the coming of Messiah. But definitely, what we see today going on with the Israeli soldiers, with, you know, the number one item in the Israeli economy today that's being purchased, the number one item, not apples, not oranges. Does anybody know the number one? item being purchased today in the land of Israel. Tzitzit. The fringes. They say there's not a soldier going into Gaza who hasn't decided, I'm going to do something special and feel and dress like a Jew by wearing a four-cornered garment that has fringes. Even though many of them don't affiliate themselves with being religious or observant. There definitely isn't. And this is an amazing thing. And I urge every single one of you, if you have the opportunity, if you have the ability to undertake the same mitzvah, be no different. We are all soldiers too. We come and learn Torah. We're also protecting the Jewish people. We're protecting the, we're the spiritual protectors of the Jewish people. You know, when, when the Jewish people fought against Amalek, there were two parts of the war. We mentioned this previously. Moshe, who held up his hands, and Joshua, who was down in the battlefield. And which part does the Torah talk about? It talks about Moshe holding up his arms. Because Moshe was the spiritual component of the war. They were the physical component of the war. The soldiers who are going into Gaza, they're the physical representatives of the Jewish people in war. We are the spiritual representatives of the war. My dear friends, it's our job to do everything we can to learn more, to pray more, to commit more in whatever way we can, whether it be acts of spiritual activity to get involved, whether it's prayers that we recite on behalf of the Jewish people, whether it's the Torah we study, good deeds that we do in our community, respectively. This is, this is what's protecting our people. And they, this, those soldiers, need our mitzvahs. They need our good deeds. So, so a very good question. What, I'm just going to rephrase your question. What is the reason for all of this antisemitism that's always been in existence? So, the, the Midrash tells us that the Torah was received by the Jewish people at Mount Sinai. The word Sinai, Sinai, comes from the same word, Sinah, which is hatred. When the Torah descended at Sinai, the Midrash tells us, hatred descended at Sinai. The Torah descended, hatred descended. And I'll tell you why. There's two reasons that I'll give you now. Number one, there's jealousy. Right? When's your birthday, Ron? February. We're almost at your birthday. You're going to be turning probably 35. You look like a 35-year-old. A healthy 35-year-old young man. So you're, you're having your, your birthday soon. And I'm going to, I want to buy you a gift. So I buy you a lottery ticket. Buy you a lottery ticket. And you're like, Rabbi, thank you very much. But the likelihood of me winning is zero. So I'm going to just go to my friend sitting right to my right. And I'm going to give him the lottery. Let him feel good for, for a minute. And he says, you know what? Thank you very much. I appreciate the gesture. And he's going to say, you know what? I'm not going to win anyway. I'm going to give it to Ed. He goes and he gives it to Ed. And Ed gets the, gets the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, lottery ticket. He's like, you know, I, I really appreciate it. It makes me feel very, very special. But you know what? I'm going to give it to Harvey. And so on. It keeps on going around, around, and around, and around. Finally, it ends up at Camden. Camden gets the ticket. And Camden's like, you know what? There's nobody else to pass it around anymore. I'm just going to hold on to that ticket. And what happens? He wins $1.7 billion. And everyone's like, oh, Gavalt, what did I do? What did I do? And everyone's going, what's everyone going to think about Camden? You know, if you were really a good person, you should split it among us because we really all had it. But you know, you know what you really should do? It really is mine because I really didn't mean to give it to anyone. I just didn't want anyone to feel bad. So I, we're going to have a thousand excuses. Us who don't have that ticket are all going to dislike Camden, the nicest guy on earth. We're all going to dislike him. Why are we going to dislike him? 
because we're jealous. We could have had that. We could have had that. You know what the Midrash tells us? That God gave every nation the opportunity to have the Torah. And everyone turned it down, except for the Jewish people. Everyone could have had the Torah. They could have been that chosen nation. And they decided, for whatever reason, not to take it. The French asked what's in it. They said, well, you shall not commit adultery. Like, not, not a chance, not for us. They went to the, to, to the, uh, to the, another nation. They said, you shall not steal. Not for us. They went to the Germans and the, and the Muslims. You shall not murder. No, not for us. That all of the nations were given the opportunity and they said no. And that's why they're jealous. That's the first reason there's anti-Semitism, that the Torah was not given to them. Now they regret it. I couldn't believe it. We could have had that. We could have been that chosen nation. But there's another reason. Our sages tell us that the nations of the world have not a single movement of their finger can come against us if the Almighty does not allow it to go against us. That means that if we aren't properly behaving ourselves, the nations of the world cannot touch us. If we are behaving properly, Hashem says they have nothing on you. But if, God forbid, we're not behaving appropriately, then God says, you know what? In Gaza, throw a few rockets, put them into shape, wake them up. And It's not pleasant for us to hear this, but this is what our sages show us time and again throughout all of the prophets and the writings. All of Jewish scripture is about recognizing that there is a message that the Almighty sends us via the nations of the world. And we point fingers at the messenger saying, why are you guys hating on us? Really, we should be pointing to the Almighty and saying, Hashem, we realize we neglected our relationship with you. At the receiving of the Torah, the Jewish people already became a people when they left Egypt. When they left Egypt, there there was already a a hatred because we were predestined to be that nation. We were predestined to be that nation. Everybody knew if we let go of them, we're going to have these people and everyone is begging Pharaoh, please make them suffer more, kill more babies, kill more Jews because if we let them free, they're going to receive their Torah at Mount Sinai. Given the option at the beginning of time. At the beginning of all time. Correct. They were all given that option. They're like, nah, not for us. Not for us. Not for me. Potentially. Potentially. So now the Talmud continues. And the Talmud says it was nine, it was 4,291 years from the world's creation. That the world will end. Mehen melchamos taninim. You'll also have uh, wars of the sea creatures. You'll have the wars of Gog and Magog. And then Rishar Yemos Hamashiach. And the rest of the days will be the times of Messiah. Ve'ena Kadush Boruchu Mechadesh Salomo Elo Laachar Shivas Alafim Shana. And the and the Holy One, blessed is He, will not renew His world until after seven thousand years. The Gemara records a different version of the scrolls text, which Rav Acha Berei de Rav Amar, Rav Acha, the son of Rava, says, "La'achar chamishes alafim shana itmar." After five thousand years is what was actually stated in that scroll that was written in two languages. It was written in Ashu, two, not two languages, but rather two different font types. One was the scroll. Ashuris font, and one was the the uh, holy tongue. Okay, my dear friends, we're going to continue, God willing, next week. We'll learn more about what is going to be happening in the times of Messiah, what to expect and when to expect. And my dear friends, have a magnificent Shabbos. Hashem should protect us all. Please do mitzvahs for yourselves. Do mitzvahs for the Jewish people. We need as many mitzvahs. A mitzvah is something that brings us closer to God. If tonight at 5.11 p.m. you're able to light Shabbos candles on time, light Shabbos candles. If you can say a prayer, say a prayer. Do whatever you can to elevate yourselves 
because that elevates the entire world, the entire Jewish people. We need as many merits as possible. So my dear friends, we hope and pray that we're in the times of Messiah, and hopefully we should all merit to greet Messiah in Jerusalem. Amen. Have a great Shabbos.